So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. And during today's webinar, we're joined by Mike Newman, who will go through a mock exam for the Project Development and Documentation Division of the ARE, uh, which of course, as everybody knows, is a, is a tricky division for sure. A couple thoughts <clears throat> to share with you guys about what's going on with testing right now. So first of all, uh, you know, in-person testing at Prometric testing centers is currently open, um, but it's with reduced capacity. So you know, there aren't as many seats as available as usual. So if you want to take this test in person, you know, just make sure that, uh, you know, you register as soon as possible so you can get a seat. Uh, secondly, uh, what's really interesting, so today's October 15th, 2020. So in about a month, on November 16th, 2020, you can start taking the ARE online. And uh, what's interesting is that there's no changes to the content or the division structure. Um, but what's interesting is that they're actually um, they're reducing, I believe, the number of questions a little bit. So there'll be, a, you know, a couple fewer questions. I believe the breaks are a little bit uh, longer. And then also that test um, is going to be the same test whether you take it in person or whether you take it online. Um, so some positive changes there. What's great, of course, is, you know, with it going online, now you don't have to worry about, you know, um, um, you know, concerns about, you know, you know, uh, being in that environment. Of course, you could just take it from the comfort of your own home, which is really good. So I uh, just posted a link in the chat uh, if you'd like to review uh, NCARB's website for all the details, uh, which they recently published. They held a webinar last week um, and are providing a little bit more information today. So that being said, uh, that's a, a certainly a positive uh, update. A couple updates to our products. For those of you joining us for the first time, Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved test prep provider for all six of the ARE 5.0 divisions. Uh, we offer a comprehensive test prep for the ARE with video lectures, practice exams, flashcards, and virtual workshops, all available online and with memberships available either for individual architects or for firms or AI chapters or schools. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash ARE 5 exam prep. Uh, which just shared that link in the box. Similarly, if you want to, uh, if you want to get, we do sell firm licenses. So if you want to get your firm involved and have your boss pay for your membership, just go to the uh, the firm page on our website. Uh, that link also shared as well. Our next session for ARE Live um, is on November 12th, and we're going to feature one of the exercises from our virtual workshops for the PCM exam. Uh, and this will be really good. I think you guys will like this because you can get a taste of how those workshops run um, and get a little extra practice on your test uh, prep. So it should be a good one. Looking forward to that one, of course. Today, uh, we're going to be engaging exclusively uh, on our online ARE community. So head over to that thread if you haven't already. Uh, I'm going to go there right now. If you go to community.blackspectacles.com, you'll see all those like colored cards at the top. Click the one that says ARE Live. And at the top, we pinned the topic uh, for today, uh, project development and documentation. If you go in there, um, all you got to do, looks like there's already some comments going. Um, so that's where I would encourage all of you to make a comment, say hello. We actually have some of our experts, uh, in particular, Kat Hurd. Uh, she's going to be helping us. Hi, Kat. Uh, she's going to be helping us answer some questions over there on the community. I'll be over there as well. So uh, hop over there. Uh, let me see. What else am I supposed to say here? Uh, ooh, one of the cool things is everyone who posts in our thread today over in this community um, uh, will be eligible to win a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So all you got to do is say hi <laughs> and stay tuned. Uh, you have to say hi on the community and then stay tuned until the end of the podcast to see if you won. Uh, so I'd encourage all of you to hop over to that website right now and just say hello. Um, as We're trying to build up uh, some clarity and awareness about that community, which is a really great free resource for everybody. So that's what's going on with that. And then at the end of today's podcast, we have a special discount on Black Spectacles individual memberships. So uh, we'll share that uh, at the end. Uh, so stick around for that. And then of course, our guest lecturer today is Mike Newman. He's a senior lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, as well as the founder of Shed Studio. And he is the instructor for Black Spectacles online ARE exam prep lectures. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, Mike. Before I hand it over to you, just want to remember one more time, we'll be answering all the questions over in the community, so head over there. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Mr. Newman. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and you have a house full of uh, 
uh, homeschoolers uh, right at the moment, um, given everything. And I have uh, construction going on in my house and a very nosy dog. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how this uh, transpires. But hopefully we'll, we'll all cross our fingers and hope for the best. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, so as Mark said, uh, we're going to be talking about the project development and documentation. And uh, the PDD exam is the, the exam that's sort of really focused on if you imagine uh, kind of somewhere between uh, design development and construction documents and just before you're going into construction, kind of anything in that range. So you've already done presumably uh, any of the research that you're going to be doing. Um, you've, you've already done your code searches and things like that. And now you're really figuring out how do you, how do you uh, sort of finalize the development choices in a design and how do you then document it and send it off uh, so that people can price it or build it or code reviewers can look at it? So it's kind of a it's sort of focused at that range. I always think it's useful to think about where the exam is sort of focused because it, it, it will change the way that you answer some of the questions. So let's dive right in. Um, and let's see here. Uh, all right, so uh, um, these questions are, uh, you know, meant to be sort of get you thinking in the way that the uh, exams will uh, will have you thinking. But also, there's a few things that are, some of these are thrown in in such a way that it really just gives me a chance to talk about a few issues. Um, so don't be uh, overly shocked if, uh, if something if, if you didn't grasp everything. They're not the most brilliantly written questions. They're just here uh, for tools for us to have a conversation. All right, uh, number one, uh, the design team is detailing the wall system for a multifamily project. Your code research has uncovered a need for a two hour rated separation for the HVC makeup air shafts to the RTU up on the roof, the RTU being a rooftop unit, um, uh, HVAC unit up on the roof. Uh, which uh, type of wall would you choose? So key things here we're looking at, one is the two hour rated, uh, one is the idea that it's a, a vertical uh, shaft going up to the rooftop, so we know it's vertical. Uh, and we take a look and we can see uh, on, for example, on A, uh, we have a single layer um, of uh, type X uh, on a drywall on both sides. That's a one hour wall. Uh, type B here, we have a double layer of 5 eighths type X on each side of the wall. That is, in fact, a two hour wall. So that's the first contender here. Uh, this one back over here on C, that's again back to a single layer. That's back down to a one hour or actually potentially even less. Uh, so, so far, B looks like the, the right answer. But in fact, of course, what's really happening here is D. And that's the correct answer. And the reason is, is because it is a uh, US, in this case, it's calling out a USG gypsum liner panel. Uh, and you can see that uh, the liner panels continue past the floor uh, and the ceiling, meaning that it's implying the continuous shaft. So there's an interesting little detail. The, the studs, like a regular stud, and we're talking about metal studs. Gonna look kind of like that. And that's gonna allow me to put the drywall, maybe I got two layers of drywall on each side of it. The little fold uh, at the edge there is just to give it a little strength. Um, and effectively, this is a cold rolled um, steel. Um, and so that's a perfectly logical way. We can uh, screw into each of those uh, through the drywall, hold the drywall up uh, in that sort of smart pattern. But when we're doing a, a, a shaft wall, if I am standing on one side and I'm putting that drywall up, that's great. But how do I stand on the other side to put that drywall up? There's no floor. So I can't do a shaft wall in the same way that I do a regular wall. So in this case, I'm gonna draw it right up here. Hopefully that's a little easier to, easier to see. That stud looks something like that. And what that does is allows the two layers of drywall 
on the one side, just like normal. Then on the other side, there's going to be a one inch thick liner panel, as it's usually referred to, that fits into that little T. Uh, this is, these are often called uh, HCs, so you can see the H and the C next to it. I like calling that a T because I think it's easier to see the T. Um, but then the idea there is that I can actually do this from the one side. So I can do first the liner panels, and I kind of angle them in, kind of shove them into that corner, push them all the way in, and then slide it to the backside, and then find the sort of happy medium. Uh, and then I can uh, put a little uh, sealant in there. Uh, I do it uh, all the way along for the, the shaft side. And then I come back after I'm done with that, and I add the two layers of drywall on the inside floor side. Um, sort of understanding kind of a series of different wall types. The reason I mentioned specifically shaft walls is because they're just a different enough that it's an easy kind of question to sort of see if you actually really understand kind of the mechanics and therefore the ability to be able to draw a detail showing how these things work. Um, in general, you're gonna find uh, that this kind of thing will show up somewhere on the exam uh, it may not be the focus of the question, but the idea of understanding how these pieces fit together uh, is likely to show up uh, at some point. And it's also important to just remember that it's not surprising to have a rated wall for a shaft wall, because of course, if I have holes through my floors, then uh, fire or smoke or uh, heat uh, can find its way from floor to floor, and that's a really dangerous thing. You wanna stop all the ways to get uh, so that fire can't easily get from one floor to the next. Uh, it's okay to have a fire as long as it can be contained. Uh, you just don't want a fire that uh, can't be contained and then jumps easily from one place to another. So uh, having a rated shaft wall, uh, almost all shaft walls would be rated uh, because you should be very nervous about uh, fire or smoke or heat uh, going up through those as a chimney and attacking the other uh, floors. So there you are, D would be the answer, that's a shaft wall. Thank you, Mike. Hey, I just wanna like make a comment to everybody. <clears throat> if you guys have questions uh, about these questions, about the mock exam, uh, post your questions over here in the community. We already have a ton of people commenting, so thank you everyone who's done that. Uh, but if you have a question, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be pulling from our ARI community and we'll look forward to, uh, if you have a, a, a good question here, I'll, I'll pitch it to Mike during the live session. So just wanna encourage everybody to throw a question. I don't see, Mike, if we go back one, um, there is a question here from Bertrand uh, which says, what's the difference between gypsum type X and type C? Maybe could you comment briefly on that, Mike? Um, yeah, so uh, there's a, uh, essentially a couple different kinds of uh, drywall that you can buy that meet the fire ratings. Um, and type C can meet it as well as type X can meet it. Um, they're just cost differences. Um, and so we have, uh, in working with our um, uh, contractors, uh, they found that the type C, when they were doing shaft walls, it, it, was, it all sort of was easier for them because it was uh, made it a little um, easier to kind of maneuver around the tight shafts. And so we went with the type C's. Um, but uh, in other situations, I'm a big fan of, in general, the 5 8 inch, which is the Type X. Um, I believe in, like, if you have a one-hour wall or even just a, a sheet of drywall on uh, going from stud to stud, if you have a half-inch sheet, like, if it's not something you're worried necessarily about the fire rating on, you just have a half-inch sheet, yeah, that's, that'll be fine. But I find that the 5 8 inch sheet actually just has just enough more density that if you like lean against the wall or you're you know putting a painting up or something, uh, it just has that more density and so it has a it it feels stiffer and so in general I always am using the five eighths uh, just to keep it simple so everything is five eighths. But when we were working with the contractors on this particular building that I took this drawing from, uh, they actually asked us to do the half inch on the shaft walls because it was tight fit. 
So they were just trying to make it easier for themselves to get it in. But there's a number of different kinds. Um, if you uh, if you do the searches, you can you can find uh, all the ones that are that will meet the um, fire rating. Uh, not everything does, um, but generally at this point, if you're buying five eighths inch uh, drywall, it's going to meet the fire ratings. Got it. Thanks, Mike. And hey, uh, your uh, your mic is a little buzzy. Um, so my tech team is asking if you can check the back of the uh, the Yeti to see if it's set to the two overlapping rings. I don't know if that would help, but just I uh, wanted to throw that out there. I can generally hear you just fine, but um, okay. Um, is that any better? Yeah, that's super better, man. Wow. <laughs> you, you're like the tone of your voice now is so much nicer. <laughs> There we go. It's, it's, Did you? It was 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 your dog Viola? I think her. That's her name. Yeah. Uh, uh, was she sitting on the internet wire again? Is that what it was really? <laughs> right. She's chewing the wire. Off right. the internet. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we'll see what happens here. It, Sounds uh, great, Mike. Thank you. Keep going. Okay, we're going to take a look at number two here. Uh, while detailing the retaining wall for the garden entrance sequence, you realize you need to add the required reinforcing. Which of the following is the most likely? So the the concept of a, a question like this is really just to see uh, if you kind of basically understand the gist of uh, like when we're talking about concrete, we're usually also talking about steel. Uh, we're doing reinforcing steel inside the concrete and that uh, concrete is spectacular uh, at compression, but it is awful at tension. Uh, and so uh, every place in that uh, concrete element, whether it's a beam, a column, or uh, in this case, a retaining wall, every place where we expect there to be tension, we're going to want to make sure that that's where the steel goes. And every place where we expect compression, eh, we don't really need to worry about putting too much steel there because the concrete can handle it just fine. Um, and so the big question on something like this is, well, where is the tension and where is the compression? Um, so if we're looking at this, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to use this first one here to kind of sketch on, hopefully. So imagine the pressure from the soil. So I've got a bunch of soil, it's trying to topple this thing over. Right, so what's that gonna do? If this was a basement wall and we had a floor structure, and so the floor was bracing the basement wall, well then it would look something like that because it would be braced at the top and the bottom. But because it isn't braced at the top, instead it's gonna look something like that. So that pressure is gonna bend that over. Now I'm exaggerating here because it's the nature of uh, making points. Um, obviously, the concrete doesn't bend that much. If it did, uh, we got some serious cracking. But so th what that's telling us is that this thing is going to look kind of like that. But also, if that part is bending over, because this is a solid concrete, it means that this part is going to try to keep that 90 degree angle but there's still pressure coming down here from the soil. So that part is going to end up looking kind of like that. So again, a big exaggeration, but um, hopefully you can see uh, hopefully you can see what's uh, what's going on there. So then the big question is, well, where is the tension and where is the compression? Uh, this part of this wall is being smashed together. So that's where the compression is. This part of that wall is being stretched apart. So that's where the tension is. It's the longer, it's becoming a longer line, if you will, and the inner one is becoming a shorter line. That's how you can tell the difference. And then same down here, this is becoming a longer line and therefore that's where the tension is. And this is becoming a shorter line and then it's kind of the opposite there. This little front part can go in a no number of different ways. It's sort of a, it's a little more complicated. But the key part here is this section right here is where uh, kind of along that face is where uh, the vast majority of the tension is. 
and then similarly right down there on that uh, uh, back piece. So when we look through the system, uh, the uh, if we look at C, for example, putting all the rebar down the middle, well, that'll work to some degree, but it's not really the prime spot for where the tension is. Um, this one, uh, D, looks pretty good, except I'm not really sure why we would have stopped the uh, um, uh, horizontal reinforcing from going all the way up. Uh, plus, this doesn't look like it's in the right spot. But B, that's looking pretty good to us. So here we've got the line of reinforcing right where we think the tension is going to be in that vertical segment, and then right there in uh, that uh, back horizontal segment. Uh, and then in the front, they've got it in both, and that's just because the front has a lot of other forces uh, going on. And so you, it's the, the one that we know it's going to be is down at the bottom, but usually you'd also leave it up at the top as well. So the answer here is definitely B, and it's all about, uh, it's not about sort of memorizing anything, although these are actually pretty easy to memorize. Um, it's about just understanding and being able, being able to picture uh, how this thing would move given the forces that are going to be on it, uh, and therefore where the tension is going to be and where the compression is going to be. Anything on that, Mark, or we're good, good to go? Uh, I think we're good to go. I don't see... Okay. Uh, actually, hold on a second here. Uh, no. Um... Yeah, no, we're good. Go right okay. Ahead. All right, number three. Uh, while calculating the final specification and spacing for the general office for the contract uh, document set, uh, so there's a word missing here. Hopefully that was clear for the lighting. Um, spacing for general office lighting. Uh, I don't know if that was my fault or somebody else's fault, so apologies there. Um, uh, so while calculating the final specification and spacing for the general office lighting for the contract document set, uh, the designer should consider which of the following. Uh, and we have work plane, efflorescence, halogen location, maintenance schedule, wall and ceiling finishes, metal halides. So what we're trying to figure out is the specification uh, and the spacing of the lighting. Um, and what that's referring to is there's a whole series of different possible ways that you can uh, calculate the spacing and the specification. Uh, the one that uh, I've always liked, um, I think it's kind of fascinating, is the zonal cavity method. And the zonal cavity method is just, uh, it's, a, it's a very long uh, uh, formula and you have to figure out the uh, coefficients that go into each of those parts of the formula by analyzing the site and the design ideas and how this is going to work. Um, many of you may have tried doing uh, this sort of thing uh, in one of the online systems where you can go online, like different manufacturers will have like, you know, uh, put in a bunch of information and it'll tell you what spacing you need. Well, essentially they're using something like the zonal cavity method. They just have it behind the wall of the, of the internet. And so you're just inputting numbers and then it's doing all those calculations for you and putting it together. Um, but the idea here is you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how powerful a light, how much, how many lumens are we gonna have coming out of these uh, fixtures? And how often do we need to have them spaced? So the kind of first question is going to be, so there's my table or my desk. Uh, and typically when we're talking about these things, that is going to be the work plane and that is typically about 30 inches above the floor. It's not always the work plane. Uh, in a corridor, you don't have any desks, but I still need to see where I'm going and everything. So in that case, the work plane is the floor. Uh, if I have a bunch of art on the wall and I have some lights that are focused directly on that art, the work plane might be say 60 inches uh, above because 
the the work of that light is to light up the the piece of art so the question is where is the light needed like what's the point of, of that we're trying to design for with these this lighting system we're talking about a general office lighting therefore i can almost guarantee you the work plane would be 30 inches off the floor uh, because that's where everybody's working um, so that is going to be the sort of first question uh, and there it is right there um, and then I'm probably going to have a bunch of lights up at the ceiling and I'm doing some that are slightly uh, pendant lights so these lights are going to project light down into the space in sort of diffuse sorts of ways um, using diffusers and various other ways but they're also potentially going to light up vertically and uh, light the ceiling up, which is then going to bounce light uh, into the space. Uh, and so we're going to get lots of different bouncing light, which is, of course, is what exactly we, we want in an office space. We don't want a bunch of can lights in an office, um, typically. You can sometimes if they're high enough up or some things. But typically, you don't want like a direct light over the workspace uh, in an office setting, because then if you're like typing on a laptop or you're, uh, you know, trying to draw or write or something, your hands are probably causing shadows onto the thing that you're trying to do and or your or your body is casting a shadow onto your keyboard or whatever it is. And so that uh, direct light is actually usually pretty problematic in an office setting but very indirect light, very diffuse light, very ambient light is exactly what you want. And then therefore I get an even light over every surface. Um, and that's really what we're looking for, especially at that work plane, a consistent level of, of lighting. And then at the work plane, we'd be looking for uh, presumably somewhere between 30 foot candles of light up to maybe 50 foot candles. It's kind of interesting to note that back when I started uh, going like when I was an undergrad and I was doing a class on this kind of stuff um, many, many moons ago, um, the expectation was 75 to 100 foot candles for a typical office. Uh, and the big change that happened in that meantime, everybody now works on computers and the computers uh, have their own light. And so having 100 foot candles is actually probably gonna cause glare problems with your computers. Uh, and so we now expect way less light than what uh, we would have if we were uh, talking about, uh, you know, in the, you know, early 80s or 70s or something like that. Um, so uh, the expectation would probably be about 30 to about 50 foot candles. The, the more computer focused the office is, it'd probably be closer to 30 foot candles. The more uh, sort of paper focused it is, like say a law firm or something where they may literally have to read the fine print. Uh, or if you need to be able to tell very fine color separations or something, I'd probably be up more in the 50 to 60, maybe even a little higher than that range. Um, but I want that even lighting through the space. Um, and so uh, kind of right off the bat, we can actually see that there's a bunch of things going on. So first of all, the dimension from uh, the actual light fixture uh, where the, the lamps are down to the work plane, that's going to be an important thing. Um, understanding the other dimensions would also be useful uh, because that's going to tell us about how it's going to be reflecting. If you sort of take a moment and just imagine a very different example. Okay, so that's uh, that's you sitting at your desk in a much, much bigger room. Uh, well, if I have those same pendant lights coming down and now I'm expecting them to get reflectance off of that or to have reflectance off of the sidewalls, those distances are just too big. So as those distances get larger, the, the reflectance is going to have less of an impact. But in this first drawing we did, this is a relatively small room that ceiling reflectance and the wall reflectance will have a very big impact on just how much light actually gets to my work surface, my work plane. So uh, right there, we've got the second of the answers that we're most interested in. 
Um, and then uh, the next question comes sort of more, uh, a little more obtusely. There's a couple answers in here uh, that um, are sort of leading you on, but are not correct. Uh, one is metal halides. Metal halides is a type of uh, um, lighting system. It's an HID, a high intensity discharge lighting system. It's pretty rare. Some offices will use them occasionally, but generally you don't use them in an office setting. But also it's not really what the question is asking. It's a, it's a specific type um, and it's, uh, it's not sort of calculating the, the process. Um, so it's not really a reasonable answer, but especially it's also, you just don't use metal halides in most office settings. They're used for like gymnasiums and uh, stadiums and things like that. Another one would be the halogens. And again, uh, halogen is a type of incandescent um, and they're pretty cool and interesting. They're very clever. They take the excess heat from the regular incandescents because the problem with incandescents, they're awful because they produce all this excess heat, which means you're not getting very much uh, light for the amount of energy you're putting in. You're getting mostly heat for the energy uh, that you're putting into it and you really want light. Um, but the halogens are very clever. They take that excess heat and, and reflect it back to the filament to make it burn hotter, which means it then produces a brighter, whiter light. So halogens are kind of cool and kind of interesting, but they're still not really logical for an office setting. You would use them more in like a store where you're trying to highlight uh, the color in, uh, in the fabrics uh, at a Gap store or something like that. Um, you might use them in a grocery store, you'd use them uh, on certain kinds of art or something like that, but not for the general office lighting. So that leaves us with efflorescence and maintenance schedule. Uh, and efflorescence sure sounds like a lighting issue because uh, it sounds like you know, fluorescent lights, but efflorescence actually is a word that comes from uh, masonry and it's about how uh, um, minerals uh, leach out of the masonry and show up on the surface and kind of cause that white material uh, on the surface of uh, brick. Um, so it's not efflorescence, which means the actual third answer here is weirdly the maintenance schedule. And this is the one that probably would catch everybody. This is why I'm choosing this one. So uh, this is really just to give me a chance to sort of mention these issues. Um, uh, it's weird to think that you would think about the maintenance schedule as part of the lighting design. But if you think about it for a moment, like imagine this room, let's say we have two different versions of this very room that we've just drawn here. And uh, one is a very high-end law firm in a downtown city uh, where they're paying some enormous amount of rent and uh, it's a super high-end. And the other one uh, is exactly the same size and same hanging and everything, but it's actually uh, in a very uh, 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 poor part of town and it's a, a classroom for a junior high school. Let's consider the maintenance schedules for those two different situations. Uh, if you imagine the, the light fixtures in the, the, that very expensive law firm, I bet they get dusted at some regular interval. I bet the, the light, uh, the reflectors on the um, fixtures themselves get dusted at least every uh, couple of months or every six months or something, if not more often than that. So that dust buildup that can happen on the light fixtures just doesn't happen in that situation because they're constantly cleaning it. Okay, now let's go back to the other one, which was the uh, tough uh, neighborhood uh, junior high school. Like, really, you think those uh, light fixtures are gonna be dusted every couple months and keep the dust off of them? No, of course not. They're gonna get build up. They're trying hard to keep everything open, let alone have people do kind of fancy pants uh, kinds of cleaning like that. Uh, so if you're the lighting designer, you have to actually realize that and know that in that junior high school situation, because the uh, maintenance is not likely to be as sort of top notch as the other example, that I'm actually gonna have to put in more uh, powerful lighting or space them closer together, some way that I get more light into the space because I know, because of the nature of the maintenance, that I know that that is gonna be a buildup of dust on those bulbs, on the lamps inside the fixtures, uh, and therefore not as much light is going to make it out and bounce into the space. 
uh, this is sort of one of those counterintuitive things that like it's hard to imagine, but because you know that, it doesn't make sense for you to design them the same way. If you design them the same way, then by year one or year two in, uh, the people in the junior high are getting less light. And the whole point was to get a certain level of light onto the work plane. And so if you're trying to get, say, 40 foot candles onto the work plane in, in those two scenarios, then I would have to add uh, a more powerful, I would have to use a more powerful fixture that's pr producing more lumens in order to get the foot candles that I want, knowing the fact that the maintenance schedule isn't going to be as uh, sort of uh, full-fledged um, in the in that one situation. So there's actually a bunch of things like that that are built into something like the zonal cavity method. And if you're doing one of those online ones, they're going to ask you a couple of kind of interesting questions. You might sort of wonder why they care, because you're thinking, well, the room is 30 by 30 or something like that. And like, why do they care where it is? And well, this is why they care. They're they have in their algorithms a bunch of assumptions about the way that you answer those questions. They're gonna say, oh, I see, so uh, this is a school, therefore we think it's not gonna be maintained as well, therefore we'll, up, we'll change the way the, the formula works in order for it to, to produce the actual correct amount of light, uh, not on day one, but as the, as the space is used over a span of time. Uh, other examples would be uh, light loss factor, if you're using fluorescent lights, that's a really big part of it. If you're using LED lights, it's um, still a part of it. It's not as big a part of it as it would be for the fluorescence. And what light loss factor is referring to is the fact that, you know, when I install those, uh, we'll talk about fluorescence just for the, to make the point. If I install a brand new fluorescent light fixture uh, up at the ceiling, and I've got say four foot uh, tubes in there, uh, the fluorescent uh, light tubes, uh, uh, lamps, uh, you know, on day one, that's 100% of the capacity of the light is coming out. On day, uh, you know, 300, uh, it's probably 98% uh, capacity uh, of the light coming out. By the time we get to sort of year three, year four, year five, it's probably down to 90, 89% or something like that. And then it'll keep going down a little bit by little bit. And by the time I get to say 15 years, uh, those fluorescent lights are probably producing, I don't know, maybe 65, 70% of uh, what they were producing on day one. Um, and then at some point, right around 60 some percent, it's just gonna stop working. Um, and so that's just this light loss factor over a span of time. Now, again, kind of along the same lines as the maintenance schedule, are they going to be replacing all of the bulbs every, uh, say, three years or something like that? Uh, at which point everything stays pretty close to that original 100%, it's like always in the 90s. Or like that junior high school we were just talking about, uh, are they just gonna wait until the bulbs go out in order to save money and then they'll just replace each bulb as it goes out? Well, in that case, in that latter case, those bulbs are all gonna be much farther along in that light loss capacity. And so therefore you have to build that in. And so again, we have to up the amount of the original light knowing that you know five years down the road, uh, they're not gonna just be replacing these all the time. They're gonna be waiting for them to go out. So they're gonna be more of those lamps are gonna be at the farther end of their capacity. And so they're gonna have less light coming out of them. Like I said, the LEDs uh, that are being used to kind of replace those kinds of fluorescents still have a light loss factor, but it's not as dramatic. Um, so it, the uh, um, you knowing that when you're doing these calculations, it would be a less important uh, in the calculation because it's just not as big a deal. But the maintenance would still be a big deal. The wall and ceiling finishes would be a big deal. And where that work plane is and how much light you're trying to get to it would definitely be a big deal. And just kind of to ram the point home, imagine if you painted the ceiling black. Uh, well, clearly a lot of that light bouncing around off that ceiling would just not have as big an impact on the space. You wouldn't, some of it would get absorbed into, into the ceiling. And so you just wouldn't have as much uh, light down at the work plane. Uh, and same would be for the walls. Like let's say instead of having, you know, uh, white painted walls, you had, um, 
uh, say a burlap wall finish. I don't know why you would use burlap for a wall finish, but let's say you had burlap wall finish. And so it's a very rough surface and it's a dark color. Well, again, clearly you're not gonna get the same kind of uh, reflectance uh, in that situation. So there's a whole series of different issues you're thinking about when you're trying to finalize the specification and uh, the spacing on those things. And the way that you do it, typically something like the zonal cavity method is, you're going to make an assumption. You're gonna say, all right, we're gonna put uh, this uh, particular fixture and we're gonna put them six feet apart from each other. And that fixture has three uh, lamps in it, three bulbs in it. Uh, and so we have three bulbs in a fixture every six feet uh, and then the other direction as well. Uh, and I'm gonna just try that. I'm gonna plug in all the coefficients. I'm gonna plug in the coefficient for the maintenance for the light loss factor, for the reflectance, for all of those things. I'm gonna plug them all in, and then I'm gonna find out, oh, we only got to 25 foot candles. That's not good enough. So then I know I can either go in and put in uh, bulbs that produce uh, more lumens, or maybe use the same light fixture, but one that has uh, four lamps in it instead of three, or maybe I jump it from four foot spacing, uh, from six foot spacing to four foot spacing, or something like that. Right, so I start with something and then we see if it works and then I have the ability to adjust and make sure that the specification and the spacing works right. That was long, sorry about that, that took a long time. <laughs> That's all good, Mike, thanks for the good thorough explanation. I think we're good on questions over here. For that one. All right, number four, while preparing for the energy model, you need to transfer the R value of a window, R4.2, uh, into a U value to do the heat loss calculation, which is correct. So the answer here, the first thing to say is that the R value is the reciprocal of the U value, and equally the U value is the reciprocal of the R value, which means that C is the correct answer. So what we're saying there is U equals one over R and R equals one over U. Um, and the concept here, the sort of R and the U are really telling the same story. They're just looking at it from different sides of the coin. So the way I always think about it is the R stands for resistance. Um, I don't know if that's actually where the R came from, but I always say R stands for resistance. And then the question is resistance to what? And the answer to that is R stands for the resistance of uh, the resistance to heat flow. So if a material has a high R, that means it is very resistant to letting heat flow through it. Um, and that's great, that's useful to know. We can assemble a bunch of different materials together and figure out what the R value is for that assembly. And we can understand just how resistant that assembly is to letting the heat flow from one side to the other. And that's a very useful thing, especially when you're comparing different walls uh, trying or roofs or whatever, trying to make a decision about which one is going to be the, the most useful or best, most efficient uh, in these various situations. But if you kind of think about it from the other side, like I have a structure here and I'm going to have a heating system that I'm trying to figure out. That's part of doing the energy model. And that heating system is going to be giving heat into the space. Now, it's probably not going to just be a box giving off heat. Uh, it'll have ductwork or it'll have radiators or whatever. But I have an envelope and then I put this system inside of it that can produce heat. Um, I'm going to use heat. Uh, we would have a similar conversation about cooling seasons, but we're gonna talk about heat for now just to keep it simple. And so it's useful to know the R value that's gonna tell us about uh, how good these walls and roofs are at resisting the flow of heat out. And then there's a bunch of other issues we would do at the slabs and around doors and some other stuff, but let's just, for the simplicity sake, we'll talk about walls and roofs. Uh, and so understanding the R value of each of those systems becomes very, very useful to understand how good it's going to be at keeping that heat in. But if I'm trying to calculate 
how big this device needs to be, like how many BTUs does it need to produce? Because we're trying to figure out, we're trying to do an energy model. We're trying to understand just how big a system we need. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, we need to know all these R values and all that sort of thing. But what I'm really concerned with is not at how good it is at resisting the heat flow. I wanna know how good it is at transmitting the heat from one side to the other. So when this heat flows into the space, how easy is it for it to send for that wall system, uh, in that case, to send the heat from the inside to the outside or through the roof assembly? How good is that roof assembly at transmitting? So it's the same question as how good is it at resisting? It's just looking at it from the other side. And so the U is transmittance. R is resistance, the U is transmittance. I don't know why it's not T, it would make more sense, but uh, U is for about the transmittance. And because what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to size this uh, system here, uh, whenever I'm trying to size the system, I need to know, okay, if I put X number of BTUs into this space, well, how fast will that uh, heat energy be transmitted right outside. Uh, and so we're looking at the U value when we're talking about sizing a system. Um, and when we're doing energy models, we're sizing systems, we're uh, comparing different systems in different, uh, uh, for, for different ways. So part of doing the energy model is gonna be about sizing that system. And you would need to have all of those in U, uh, not necessarily in the R. Um, so if I'm comparing two walls to make a decision about which one is better, I'm probably gonna be talking about it as an R value um, because that just sort of logically makes sense. It's easy to see them and that's just how we talk about it, whether it's smart or not, it's just how we do. But if I'm talking about uh, trying to size an HVAC system for inside a space, what I really wanna know is how fast it's taking that heat away from the space and sending it to the outside and that's the opposite, which is the U value, the transmittance. A couple of other things to say here. One of the things you notice is that uh, that R4.2 for a window, wow, that's a terrible R value. What that's telling us is that windows are really awful as insulators. No big surprise there. Um, if we were doing this wall as, uh, I don't know, let's say, A very short wall. So we've got say two by six studs, we've got some drywall, uh, we've got uh, maybe an insulated sheathing that's a nailable sheathing. Let's say, uh, I don't know, an inch or so. And then we've got uh, some wood siding, maybe shingles or something like that on the outside. Um, if we started adding all that up, we would have probably I don't know, about 0.5 R for the uh, drywall, uh, for the insulation between those two by six studs. Uh, we would have uh, at uh, five and a half inches times three, let's just say uh, five times three to make it easy. Uh, so that's about 15 uh, R15. Then we'd have the insulating sheathing um, maybe we can get about uh, five or six, let's say five out of that. Uh, and then the wood itself, we get it in maybe another one or so. Um, so we're at, because uh, it's, let's see, the, uh, the 20, we're probably at about 22 or 23 or so by the time if I had actually done those uh, with real numbers, that'd probably be about R23. So we can then take that and compare it to another uh, wall system. Um, and start getting real comparisons. Remember, I just did the add up of the wall of the R value where there's insulation between the studs. I'd also have to do it where there's no insulation, essentially where the studs themselves and where the sole plate and the top plates are. Um, and so that's gonna end up being about 85% of the time it's insulated and about 15% of the time it's gonna be where there's wood. Um, and I would come up with another R value and then I would put them together in the appropriate uh, percentage, and I'd have a final percent. In this case, this particular one would be probably about R20 or so.
by the time I put that all together. So I can take that number and use that very easily to compare one to the other, but also check out R20 compared to R4.2, right? So the glass is way less of an insulator than our standard wall is. But the corresponding element here is, if I have a big window and this happens to be a side that allows sunlight in, I can actually counter that at least to some degree by getting solar heat gain from uh, through the windows from the sun. So even though it's a terrible insulator, it opens up other possibilities. Uh, and uh, you would, in the energy model, you would be thinking about all of those things. Um, R4.2 is actually not bad uh, for a, a window. Um, you, if you start like really doing like triple panes and uh, being as sort of fancy as you possibly can, you might be able to get it up to like six and a half or seven or something like that. I, I, maybe you can get some higher than that these days. They've gotten better. Um, but a typical window is probably going to be somewhere between about three and a half to four and a half uh, R, which is, as I said, pretty terrible. But I can get some solar gain out of it uh, as well. So the answer here, all of that uh, said, is uh, U is equal to one over R because I use the R values sometimes and I use the transmittance, the U value, other times. Uh, they're telling the same story just from opposite sides. Okay, number five. Where would I place uh, GFI or GFCI electrical boxes? So uh, GFI refers to a ground fault interrupt. Uh, GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupt. So they're essentially the same thing. Um, just one is uh, an individual electrical box, uh, electrical outlet, uh, and the other is uh, for that entire circuit, what all of the uh, outlets that would be on that one circuit. So you might have you know, 10 outlets or something on that circuit, and then they would all be uh, considered part of the GFCI, which would be the ground fault interrupt. The ground fault interrupt is this situation, um, and this is an Im important one in case any of you are uh, planning on uh, um, trying to, I don't know what, uh, uh, murder your spouse or something. Um, if you're gonna throw the uh, hair dryer into the tub, um, like uh, in order that, uh, you electrocute them, um, which may I say, we hope you don't do. Um, but if that was your plan, you better make sure that it's not a GFI outlet that that uh, hairdryer is plugged into. Because what the GFI does is, in that case, the hairdryer goes into the water, and instead of the usual path of uh, current through the only through the wire, suddenly the current path, the electrical current path, has many more options. All of that water is now, oh, it's like a, having it sort of surrounded by wire, if you will. The water isn't a great conductor of electricity, but it's good enough. Uh, and uh, suddenly the current will start rushing out of that uh, hairdryer while it's in the water and going into the water. And that sudden rush, the GFI, the whole point of the GFI is it can feel that rush and it then knows, okay, stop. Uh, and so even before your murderous intentions happen, uh, even before you're able to, you're foiled again, uh, even before you're able to, to make that happen, uh, it has, the GFI has shut off the power uh, to that line. It's kind of an amazing, uh, close to magical thing in my mind. I mean, think how fast it has to work uh, to understand that there's a, a excess sudden flow of uh, current and therefore we should shut it off just to be safe. So uh, if you're if in that situation you were plugged into a GFI or uh, a, an outlet that was part of a GFCI, the circuit interrupt, uh, it would feel that excess sudden flow and it would cut off the electricity uh, to that outlet, which would effectively cut off the electricity to the hairdryer, which would stop your murderous intentions. Um, so where do we do that? Well, we're going to do it any place where there's water, especially uh, we're going to do it in bathrooms and kitchens. Um, you know, if you're talking about, uh, the, you know, right around the sink, those are absolutely going to be GFI or GFCI. If you're talking about the other side of the room in the kitchen 
and it's 15 feet from any water source, eh, you probably don't need to worry about it. But anything that's at the counter level where there's a sink nearby, uh, absolutely. And of course, you know, one of the things they're worried about, right, is if, uh, if I have a sink in a countertop, And I have an outlet right here, uh, and you're gonna somebody's gonna plug into that outlet, and then they're gonna do their coffee maker or whatever toaster over here. And I've got water spurting out into this thing, and that wire is gonna be going right across. That's a recipe for disaster. That's why they want to make sure that these are all GFIs. Um, and so these days, typically anything in the kitchen, you'd probably do. Uh, as a GFCI, kind of catch them all, uh, anything that's near the sink. Um, uh, uh, in the old days, they, they would do them as individual ones that just the GFIs. Typically, you do it at GFCI today. Um, but it's really about those situations that are the unusual situations uh, uh, where, um, uh, specifically with water, where you suddenly get these uh, big flows. So laundry rooms, big place to be worried about. Exteriors. Uh, if you're using an exterior outlet, um, that's probably going to be referred to as a WP or waterproof outlet. So you wouldn't actually call it a GFI or a GFCI because you're going to call it a waterproof. But in the understanding of waterproof is that it is also a GFI. Um, and the reason that we call it a waterproof and not a GFI is because it has additional things about uh, having, uh, you know, so I have like the cover where the place where the plugs can go into, but then maybe I have like a cover like that that can then close down and keep water out of them. Um, and it's probably made out of a different material so that it uh, can uh, last longer outside and things like that. So the waterproof ones are GFI, but they're just also additional um, uh, constraints on it to make it even safer out there. Um, so ceiling locations, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Ceiling would actually not be a likely place for any GFI because it's hard to imagine getting water onto the ceiling unless it's coming from the floor above. So I guess I could imagine a GFI when there's a tub upstairs or something, but essentially ceiling locations would definitely uh, be pretty unlikely. Uh, media rooms, uh, places with large loads, GFI really isn't dealing with large loads. That's not really the issue. The issue is the suddenness of the flow. Uh, and so the GFI is not necessarily a useful thing uh, at the media rooms. And then bedrooms and living rooms, what that's really probably calling out would be for the arc fault, which is a different specialty type of outlet. The arc faults try to pick up on whether there's a buildup of static pressure that's likely to create that little sort of mini lightning uh, you know, when you touch something, when you've got the static buildup and to touch a, touch a metal door handle, for example, and you get that spark. Uh, there's other things like, uh, you know, imagine um, a curtain uh, or blowing around up against an outlet and you start building up some static and suddenly that arc gets uh, created and lights the curtain on fire. So an arc fault can sense that coming uh, and they'll cut it off. And so you would use it in places that you'd be specifically worried about that, which generically would be like bedrooms where you're likely to be asleep uh, and to not notice uh, something going wrong. So arc fault would be a different example. What we're talking about here though is the GFIs and the GFCIs, and those are all gonna be wet locations. All right. How about that, Mark? Thank you, uh, Mr. Newman. Um, that was really good. Uh, although I had to ask, uh, with the comments about the, uh, the bathroom, was everything okay at home? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, well, essentially, uh, uh, my, uh, my feeling about this is I can totally imagine my wife throwing that, uh, into the bathroom. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're the victim in this. I get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm the victim more likely because, uh, that just seems more plausible. And yeah. I, I think you can probably all imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, we did have one question, Michael. We go back to question number two. Uh, which was with the footing, I believe. <clears throat> uh, there was a handful of questions here. Uh, uh, let's see, our Michelman uh, from the ARE community here asked, what is the purpose of the vertical extension below the retaining wall footing? 
Oh, uh, yeah, uh, glad you asked that. That's a great question. Um, you will. Uh, this is the kind of thing that often shows up in a drawing, but not actually built, um, because it's kind of a pain uh, to do if you're the contractor. But the whole point here is, so you know, like we were saying, what's happening here is there's actually quite a lot of pressure against this thing from all this soil. Imagine a big rainfall, the soil gets saturated, it's even heavier, it's pushing against that uh, that wall. Well, the entire thing wants to slide that way, right? If ever, obviously there's some material here that's in the way for that, but essentially that whole thing wants to slide uh, to the right. To help stop that, you put this little, thingamajig, I don't even know what they call it, a key, I think they call it, uh, down below. And that's just to help stop the sliding of this entire thing. You're just creating more uh, material that it is pushing against uh, to help stop the slide. So there's two worries here. One is that, uh, as we did in this particular example in the little absurdly, ridiculously over-the-top version, um, you're worried about the concrete itself failing and it's kind of bending over. And, and so you're putting the the, um, the concrete in, uh, I'm sorry, you're putting the steel where the tension is. Um, and so you're thinking about it from that standpoint. But the second thing that can go wrong is that the entire thing can just be pushed out of the way. Like I said, imagine you have, uh, after a big rainstorm and the water is, uh, the soil is very saturated, suddenly it's much, much heavier. Or imagine there's a, maybe a truck right here or something, some big heavy thing uh, that's driving on that spot. And suddenly there's a big extra load pushing down on that soil. Well, that's gonna push this way on that soil and it's gonna wanna move that whole thing out of the way. And so you're looking for ways to, to stop that. Um, like I said, um, I have uh, been in a bunch of situations where that was on the drawings, but when I would look through photos of what was actually being done on the construction site, they hadn't done it um, because it's just annoying to do that down below all the other form work and stuff that you're doing. But it's a good idea and it makes sense in that situation. That's perfect. Thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate your, uh, uh, your help on that one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and transition now. First, I want to make a, a comment about our practice exams because there's been a lot of questions about this. Uh, so as you guys all know, NCARB is moving to this new format for their exam in the next uh, three to four weeks. And what uh, what we're doing internally at Black Spectacles is we are uh, we're waiting. Uh, NCARB is currently putting the final touches on a, a example. Uh, uh, sort of like a sample of what the new format's going to look like and what those tools look like. So once that's released to the public, which includes, of course, all of you guys, uh, we're going to take that and then we're going to work on updating our practice exams to accommodate, um, you know, the changes in the number of questions, the changes in, in timing, the uh, virtual whiteboard, um, and so forth. So uh, our goal, of course, uh, as it's always been, is to with our practice exams is to make sure that the uh, the experience you guys have is as close as possible to the real exam. Uh, and so um, so we're waiting just like you guys are. I know those guys are uh, at NCARB are working hard on it. Uh, and as soon as we get it, uh, we're kind of hoping, you know, that we'll be able to get it out and live in early November. Uh, but we're going to work hard to um, to get it going as fast as we can. So appreciate the hey, questions and comments on that. Yeah. Can I just add one thing on that? Um, of course. So on that one we were just looking at, uh, I showed these as four different examples just because in this format, it's hard to do the drag and drop. Um, but this kind of question would likely be more, uh, it would be a more likely way that they would do this. They'd have the outline of the, reinf uh, of the um, retaining wall, and then you would have to put the uh, steel into the correct location. So you would drag it over and you would put it right there, right? So that's an example of the kind of thing that's different in the way that the actual exam is done. You guys have managed to mimic that, but uh, we didn't do that on this this version. So yeah. I just wanted to remind people that there's mo multiple ways than just A, B, C, D to uh, have these questions be answered. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, so thank you, uh, of course, Mike, uh, for your help uh, putting this together and everybody for tuning in. As I mentioned, our next ARE Live podcast is on November 12th. 
we'll be featuring one of the exercises from our virtual workshops for the PCM exam. Last time that, that went over pretty well, uh, so we wanted to bring that uh, bring another example to you guys again. It'll be great. You'll get a taste of how the workshops run um, and how you could kind of think about them as an a addition to your test prep. Uh, we just posted a link to register for that uh, next episode in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to sign up. If you want to learn more about what we do at Black Spectacles and our ARE exam prep offerings, you can go to blackspectacles.com, or you can try out any of the course videos. We're sharing a link for that as well. Um, I mentioned that we would have a t-shirt giveaway. The lucky winner, we had a ton of comments over in the community. Thank you, everybody, for posting in here. Um, I know that there were a good number of questions. Thank you, Kat, for uh, for for being tuned in and, and answering a lot of these technical questions alongside uh, Mike's comment. So it, it was really great. Uh, the lucky winner of today's uh, giveaway of a Black Spectacles t-shirt is Roxanne G. Uh, we're going to reach out to you via email uh, to get your size and shipping information. And just a reminder to everybody, if you'd like to be eligible to win a t-shirt, uh, Black Spectacles t-shirt, post a question you have about uh, uh, in our area community and uh, you'll be uh, eligible to win. Uh, I also mentioned that we would have an individual discount. So thank you for listening all the way to the end. For those of you ready to start studying, the discount code is A-R-E-L-I-V-E 101520YT to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your Black Spectacles uh, membership. Uh, finally, tomorrow we'll email you a follow-up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know uh, what you think. Um, and share any suggestions that you may have. Uh, we actually read everything that you guys write and use it to tune our next episodes. But thanks for watching.